Okay, should we kick it off? Sure. Sounds good. Cool. All right. So, welcome everyone uh, to a webinar hosted by Muted Logic, Carter Neagle, and also Ilta. Um, so, this one is called Think Before You Automate How to Interrogate Automation Value and Choosing a Vendor. Um, so, a number of quite interesting questions which we're going to be facing off in this one. Um, and today we are joined by Shyamal um, and Lee, both of Carter Legal. So Shyamal has over 15 years experience in process optimization and automation, uh, bridging the gap between operational processes and IT. He's championed process automation and development projects in a variety of industries, including aerospace, legal, commercial real estate, manufacturing and insurance. And he is an ex expert in process risk analysis and digital transformation more broadly. Um, Lee has a background in e-discovery and litigation support. Um, he found it to be a natural fit after his law school training and background in tech. Um, he has significant experience managing lawyers, projects, and communicating complex and technical topic topics to case teams. Um, typically, at Carter, he works with clients to identify workflow improvements, taking into account unique needs and concerns of stakeholders and lawyers. And then uh, Neota's own Jonathan Joachim, who is our Director of Markets and Growth Americas on the West Coast. So it's still bright and early for him in the day to day. Um, Jonathan works with our prospects to ident identify use cases and helps them build Neota solution portfolios integrated with the rest of their tech stack. Um, Jonathan also specializes in work with our government and pro bono clients, inc including the California State Department and has experience spanning over 24 years in the legal tech space. So a very experienced and specialized team here to face off the questions today. Um, and I think I'll hand it over to you now. Um, please just note, um, feel free to drop any questions in the chat or the Q&A section, and um, we will either answer those as we go along or at the end. So thank you very much and take it away. Perfect, so, thanks so much. So uh, can I just confirm that everyone can can see the screen, perhaps? <laughs> if, um, yes. That is yes. being shared. Yeah. Perfect. OK. Uh, yep. Thanks so much for the introduction, uh, Hassan. Uh, Lee, maybe I'll let you sort of get us started off, and then we'll walk through our entire uh, topic for today. All right. Sounds good. Um, before we actually jump into the topic, uh, we did want to clarify a little bit, because obviously the title of Think Before You Automate um, a lot of people might just think we're talking about the automation process itself. And really the, the process starts so long before you identify the problem and a technology tool. Um, the timeline that a particular firm or company might have on their automation journey will depend on a variety of factors that are unique to each one. Um, and what winds up happening is a lot of times when you get to the end, you'll realize that you were on an automation journey um, all along, but before that you were just working on improving processes or trying to integrate some technology. And so uh, we wanted to start our talk at the beginning and address some of those earlier stages first before touching on the actual process automation and technology itself. Um, so with that sort of warning, I guess, um, we can go ahead and start at the beginning of the journey. Um, so, uh, Shamo, if you could go to the next slide, please. There we go. So, and I think what happens for a lot of people is that their journey really begins in one of two places, almost always, and that's either they have a workflow that they come to realize is not efficient or is broken, or maybe they just need to expand it or fix it um, or create a new one. And so they, re they start looking at processes and how, to, um, how those are gonna be changing and worked on. And that's one path. And the other one is they find a technology. <laughs> Someone comes to them with a technology or they hear about it and they're like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, we should totally use that. It'll save us a bunch of money. Um, I, I think listening to webinars, I frequently hear those referred to as the magpie 
users, um, they see something shiny and they just want to grab it. So yeah. um, I, yeah, I think, no. sorry, go ahead, yeah. Well, well, it's kind of interesting, right? Because when, when, when we talk about things like problems with, with existing processes or new technology, these aren't really new problems. They've been there for decades. They've been, as long as we've had technology in the office, there's always been this thing of you can use a word processor to do this better than you could on a typewriter, right? You could always use an ERP system instead of an Excel file or a database. And, and the, the concept of new technology to make your job better has been around for a while. Uh, likewise with processes, we've focused on process improvement, you know, for, for a century now, there's been this big push towards uh, lean processes and improving, you know, industrial processes, manufacturing processes. Um, but, but somehow I feel like we're in this period in the last couple of years that the whole thing of this automation journey has become this big topic. It, it feels like we're really stepping into a whole new world of process automation, digital transformation, digital workplace, and all these, these big things. And, and ultimately, that concept is similar. It's just, I think there's, there's much more technology. Today, it's much easier for you know, very clever people to start up uh, a company, build some really clever technology, and put it out to the world. Uh, so there's just many, many more solutions popping up all over the place. Um, and then obviously with things like cloud computing, with the, with the web, we're just aware of a lot more things that other people are doing and, and finding ways to catch our problems, catch our failures, where we're saying, we've got the metrics and the data and we know this process is inefficient, we should do something about it. Uh, so, so that's, I always find that interesting, the way, the way you know, that mindset change has, has been happening in the last couple of years for these sort of existing things we've been dealing with. Uh, yeah, absolutely. and Shyamal, I'll, I'll just add, um, you know, we get a lot of uh, clients that, that come to us to, to look at our technology and they're excited about what we're doing and the, the tools and, and um, you know, sort of the potential, but we find if they haven't done their due diligence, if they haven't really sat down and looked at, you know, what are the problems they need to solve, where, where do they need to automate, they haven't identified that, it increases the amount of time that we have to spend, you know, trying to figure that out on the front end. If they've come, if they come to us with some very specific use cases or problems that we can address, it's much easier to sort of dive into that and start working and find a way to, to bring that technology into what they're already using. Um, so I think it, it does emphasize the, the, the point that, yeah, the shiny new object is, is great and attractive, but you, you need to have something to apply that to, you know, otherwise you sit it in the corner. It's like being the, the, on the, the bleeding edge of any technology, you buy it, and then you sit <laughs> it off in the corner and hope that you can use it at some point. Um, and, you know, quite often they come back in a year and they've found that they haven't really used it as much as they thought they might have. So, so I'm sure you're making a lot of our audience sort of start nervously sweating when you say that, because <laughs> I'm sure that's happened to a lot of people and, and, and you know, we've, we've, we've all been there, but you're absolutely right. But, but you brought up an interesting point. And, and maybe if I could ask you a question, Jonathan, have you had scenarios where people have come, you know, to you to, to talk about, uh, uh, you know, Neo specifically and what it can do and, and bring up a problem that they have. And, and after some discussion, you realize what they're looking for something completely different, whether it's a, they actually need a CRM or a document management system or, you know, what, whatever you have, but in their mind, they couldn't really segregate these different technologies. Definitely. And I mean, I think that's the role of any vendor is not to just present your product, but help the client identify what their needs actually are. And, um, you know, if their needs do not fit into the technology that you can provide, your, it's to your benefit and the client's benefit to, to say, hey, you really need to look in another direction here. We'd love to help you, but what we have um, will not address uh, your your particular situation because you know all of us have probably gone down the road of of spending a bunch of time looking at something thinking it was going to do one thing for them solve a particular problem and then find out that it's not or it just can't do what you need it to do so the more you do that up front the more time you save uh, as a vendor the more time you save as a client 
and then ultimately you get a better fit between client and product and 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 problem and solution than if um, you didn't identify that up front. So so yeah, that's a, a very good point. For sure. And Lee, I'm guessing from a process standpoint, we, we've seen some of the similar sort of things, but where it's not technology, where people say, look, I really need to improve my X process or whatever it is. Uh, and you look at it and you say, hmm, no, that's not the one that's causing you the problems. It's somewhere else. And, and people mm -hmm. don't always understand how things interplay from a process standpoint, uh, even before touching the technology side. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's funny because when when you get a client coming to a consultant to help them with their improve their processes the the thing they all have in common is they realize something's wrong <laughs> yeah because if they don't if they're just fine muddling At along least. with their <laughs> yeah if they're just fine muddling along with their inefficient or broken processes and they they feel like that's okay for them and their business then they're not going to go yeah. pay somebody to help them examine it further and look into it but you absolutely are right. Sometimes they'll come to us and be like, we think it's X. And when yeah. we walk, work with them to expand on that and look a little bit wider, we realize it, it could be Y or maybe it's X and Y or maybe it's the whole other end feeding into that. Yeah. Um, and you know, there are times that technology is a solution and there are other times where maybe they built a process around a piece of technology and it ended up you know, they built an inefficient process because they wanted to incorporate this technology they bought right. um, that didn't fit. So if they've yeah. been, if they'd had someone like Jonathan at the beginning, <laughs> um, they could have avoided it altogether. Yeah. Um, but I think, but yeah, it's, it really is a long, this part of the journey, I think is one of the most important because it sets your foundation really. Absolutely. Um, and gets you started on where you look next and how you proceed um, internally on getting further along and more prepared to do the automation part at the end. Mm -hmm. For so, sure. And I think yeah, it right. might be really interesting to, to kind of do a little thought experiment, let's say it. And I pose this question to, to everybody who's, who's joined us in this webinar. Um, you know, just, just for your own sake, think about something in your mind. Let's imagine a scenario where you have a budget that's been cleared, let's say 15K, 20K, 30K, whatever it takes, uh, but your firm or your department, you know, is going to embrace digital transformation. And they say, we want to go down this road of process automation and things like that. So we want to do a pilot project. Where should we begin? What is the first process we're going to automate? And, and everybody, you know, when, you, when I ask, I love asking this question at, at you know, pre-COVID times of real physical conferences in a room because you could see everyone's you know mind starting to to sort of process it uh everybody has an idea everyone you know who's listening thought right away that if I could automate anything this is what I would do most often um I notice it's problems that cause the most problems in the company whatever it is you know there's there's an idea everybody knows this is a difficult process we're dealing with uh, then there's also the process that people tend to complain about, whether, you know, you, you hear people complain about it, or if you are in a position of process management or IT, you might get a lot of tickets or, or issues that people are saying this is really terrible. Um, or the more personal ones, like, oh, I hate filing expense reports. I wish we had a better way to do it. Well, okay, I'm going to automate that because that's what bugs me, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in, in my experience, you know, at trade shows and conferences, when I speak with people with process automation and we talk about, you know, as you mentioned, Jonathan, where do you, you know, what is it you want to automate? Here's the technology. What is it you want to do? These are the sort of things that people tend to come up with and say, this is, this is what we want to do. And, you know, more often than not, I find that, that that's kind of leading to the problem because these are the wrong way to approach process automation. Um, you're essentially taking a process that is inherently either broken um, or at the very best case scenario, inefficient. And you're saying, let's automate that and use it as a use case for process automation. And you know, I, I love the expression, when you automate a mess, you get an automated mess. And that's essentially what, what we're doing, right? So you end up now, now this broken process is gonna make you fail faster. It's gonna make more people upset faster than it was before you automated it. Um, so, so this is one of the things that I, when you we, going back to the topic of think before you automate, this is one of the points I stress to our audience and say, this is what 
you really need to think about. Um, the first steps going down the automation path are really important. Now, what happens when you end up looking at these sort of broken processes? Well, um, in your best case scenario, you will actually you know, end up with a good solution, a good automated solution that works. But if you do, then you've actually spent a good chunk of that time in improving the process to get to a certain point, to get you 80% of the way there. And then you've put the automation piece to get you the rest of the way. And that's good, that's great. There's, there's no question about that. However, that's not really a reflection on just the automation piece. So you went from you know whatever benchmark you wanna take at, 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 uh, at 100, and now you're able to do it at 200, fantastic. And you expect to get that result out of every single automation project that you do, which isn't the case because actually 80 out of that 100 improvement was done by process improvement alone, non-digital. Um, worst case scenario, as I mentioned, is you just automate a broken process and you're ending up with, with, with a real, real mess. Um, and, and that's sort of, if there's one takeaway for me that, that that's always very important is don't start automating by your broken processes. That's, that's the part that creates a lot of issues uh, going, down, going down this journey. Yeah, I, that it was very well said. And I really like that automated mess um, joke. Uh, it's very true and I hadn't heard it before, so I got to chuckle. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think that that really does highlight for me this next slide also, because once you've hit that starting point that we just discussed, where you know you have a broken process or you have a, um, a technology that you think could help and you want to start improving your processes and stuff and potentially incorporating technology, you really have a few different paths you can take. You can take them, mm -hmm. I guess I shouldn't call them paths because you can do them at the same time you can do one instead of the other, or you can um, do one for a particular length of time and do others longer. And those really are, you, like you said, Shaimal, you, you either start looking at your processes and really taking a process, um, process improvement mindset and investigating, getting all your inputs down, taking those back a step, seeing whether you need to change the inputs into what you're trying to improve um, and just sort of, that whole process improvement segment. Um, and a lot of this also, I think we should mention, and I don't think we've said it yet, is people. People mm -hmm. are integral to any process. And so making sure that the people who are involved in this aspect of the company or in leadership at the company are comfortable with this type of improvement, with spending time and money on improving things and incorporating technology if that is um, the improvement that's needed, I think it's, it's very important that you start thinking about that too. And looking at the slide, I didn't actually put it here. So uh, no, that, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great point. And, and you know, on the people topic, I think one of the, the, the things that gets missed as well is the impact of technology on people when it's not done properly. I remember um, many, many, many years ago now, I used to be in engineering and, and doing engineering process improvement and tools and development and things like that. And um, one day, uh, one of the engineering leads sort of pointed out to me that they were spending, you know, half their day doing engineering work, engineering design, and the other half updating all the tools and systems that we had provided to track the progress of engineering. And, and what, what we had completely neglected to do was to say, look, here's process, here's process improvement. But you know, from the individual person that, that's doing these process steps, how are they impacted by all these new tools, all these new inputs, and now all these new forms and all these new things that they need to do um, and and you know this gets into the topic of digital workplace, which is which is the other thing that 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 is is a a, a great uh, sort of thing to go down. But it gets into this place of tools for tools' sake, uh, or technology for technology's sake, is going to end you up in a position where we now have twenty five awesome tools to improve our efficiency, but we're doing things 25 times, you know, when, when we used to do it with one piece of paper before, have you really made it better for the, for the user, for the people, you know? Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That, that, that's absolutely true from the people standpoint. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was ahead. just going to add from a vendor perspective, you know, a couple things come up quite often. Um, you know, often a client will come to you 
and expect to take a process, as you mentioned before, that they've already done and layer a technology on top of it and basically keep the process the same, but somehow, you know, use that technology and and often that fails or doesn't work very well because that process was already broken or not very efficient and they're ignoring you know what the advantages of that technology are how that technology can actually change the process um you know at its very core so you know just layering technology on top of something you're already doing doesn't really address the situation. The other thing I see quite often is this focus on what's the most complex problem that we have and yeah. how can we fix that right away, right? So, so they take technology and they wanna fix something that not many people do very frequently, but is, is very annoying and, and it has high visibility. And that's really not where you see the gains. It's really if you peel back the layers and find what are the small efficiencies you can build that people are touching every single day. Um, and it's sort of having to change that mindset and focus in a different area is, is often what you have to do you know, during that initial process. Um, I, I will also just toss in from the legal standpoint since I I do think most of the audience here is probably legal minded that there is the stereotype about attorneys and paralegals with tech, new, new tools and new technology <laughs> that they just don't use it. And it doesn't matter how nice it is or how much better it makes their life. If they are not going to use it, then they're not going to use it. <laughs> so uh, I think getting users to use what you put in front of them is also a very important thing you have to keep in mind when when you implement any technology, but especially the sort of process automation, which is supposed to replace a manual process um, because they can just keep doing the manual one if they want, or if, they, if they're yeah. allowed to, I guess I should say. Yeah. Um, but, um, okay, and so the, the other thing that I think is important for people to consider doing in this phase, this middle ground, as I call it, um, is to look at the technology out there. There are so many, choices in the marketplace on for every type of solution, I believe it's fair to say that you can get demos, you can go to webinars sponsored by various, um, various vendors, you can get industry group web um, emails, blogs that are sort of just giving you a broad spectrum of where the technology is at or introducing various um, new things out there. And so also, I, I don't know where we're at in the COVID world with um, <laughs> trade shows like Legal Tech and- um, Oh, I miss trade shows like Legal Info Tech. <laughs> and, um, and ILTA, uh, so, but, you know, for, from that standpoint, those are great sources to be able to go and just see, sort of like get a flavor of what's out there and expand your concept of what technologies are out there that could potentially provide a solution to one of your problems. Um, so I think, I think this, and like I said at the beginning of this slide, it, it really is each of these phases, you can take them as fast or as slow as you individually or your company needs to take them. So it really, um, but I think at the end of the day, everyone goes through these to a certain extent, like Shaima was saying, it's either part of the automation or it's done in advance of the automation. Yeah. But at some point you're going to need to do this planning and prep work um, one way or another. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you know, to, to that point, maybe what, what I would like to talk about a little bit for our audience is, is getting into some concrete details as to how you do that prep work or, or where do you start with that prep work. Um, and, and what it comes down to is, so process risk analysis is a, is a really great framework across industries. It's certainly not legal specific, um, but, but it does give you a much clearer view of your process landscape uh, that I've, I've come to learn uh, many, many law firms and legal departments don't actually have. Um, I think certain industries, you know, focus a little more on it, uh, especially in the financial services area and things like that. Uh, but this is a great tool to, to, to help you understand. So what we, what we established early on was these are, the, these are not the right processes to start automation with, right? So what are the right processes? How do you identify that? 
Um, and that's where this comes in. And there's two uh, sort, of, sort of attributes that I look at, uh, process accuracy and precision and the process risk. Um, and what they essentially are, your process accuracy and precision is looking at how much deviation you have from your documented process to what users are actually doing. Are users doing what they should be doing? And for that matter, are they all doing the same thing? If you went to five users and asked them, how do you, you know, go through the invoice processing uh, uh, method, will they tell you the same thing or are they doing it slightly different? Um, and and pro, you know what it really is looking at is how well your processes are now aligned with the operations of the firm, uh, and as well as with the risk, how well they're aligned with the strategy of the firm. This gives you an idea of you know where you are with all your processes. You do this sort of analysis at at a process level, and I'd love to get into much much more detail, but you know that's you know a couple of hours of workshop in itself, and and something we can always pick up. Uh, on another session. But the idea of this is really sitting down, interviewing key users, understanding how they do what they do, reviewing process documentation, reviewing how well aligned it is, how your process governance is. Um, and then at an executive level, understanding you know, your, your five-year business strategy, uh, understanding how things are lined up together. But the way it works, you put it all together and you essentially have a matrix because we all love these little matrices. And you can plot your processes. So essentially processes that are accurate have, you know, more or less a single final ending point. Um, processes that are precise follow a standard path. So as you start having more and more deviations to your process, that becomes a process that's not very precise. And as you have more and more outcomes uh, that are possible, your process is inaccurate, to put it in a very, very simple way. So once you identify sort of where all your processes are, you can actually, there's a method where you can score them, there's, there's a whole sort of scientific method behind it and you can plot them out. And it gives you an idea. And, and you know, going back to my initial point of which process would you automate? The thing that most people think about uh, top of their mind are processes that reside somewhere over here because these are the ones that are causing all the problems. These are the ones where they're not well-documented. People aren't doing things properly. Um, and you know that's that's where that creates a problem. So inaccurate processes, you know, they lead to a lot of issues mostly caused by a lack of training uh, is, is what we see. Um, same with imprecise processes, lack of documentation, lack of checklists. There's, there's all sorts of things from a process standpoint that you can do uh, and that you can do better when you've got technology behind it. So when you've got technology that can validate fields in a form before it's being submitted, for example, you don't run into errors where the date is month, day, year, instead of day, month, year, things like that. Uh, feels like when you've got a form in a tool that can give you a drop down to select an attorney's name, it prevents the chance of someone misspelling something and invoices being sent to the wrong department and, and, and so on. So process risk analysis, uh, looking at accuracy and precision, this is one of the exercises that you want to do within the department, within the organization. Plot out your processes, and this will help you understand once you've got them plotted on such a matrix, the processes that are up in this quadrant are the ones that are pretty good to automate. They're good to say, yes, now we've got everything you know, in place. Uh, we should look at automating this, look at making it better. The ones that are down here, you know, it's not just that they sit down here, it's that you know you need to have some internal projects, um, get some process consultants and whatever it is to move them from this quadrant up here, right? So the goal is bring your processes here and then automate. That's, that's sort of the, the step that we're looking at. But if you don't know that, if you don't have this sort of map of your process landscape, it gets really difficult to understand what it is that, that you need to do. And then the, the other side of, of looking at process risk is understanding the sort of three main things of, of operational, competitive, strategic. And, and all that really means is, you know, operational risks are processes that are broken today. They're creating problems. It's like your car is leaking oil as you're driving down the road. It's something that, that is broken. Um, you know, you, you need to fix it now. Uh, it's impacting cash flow. It's impacting revenue. It's impacting your costs. It's impacting all of these things. Um, Competitive risk is, is the kind of process where it works mostly, you know, can't complain about it, but it's not necessarily the best. Are you still using, you know, mail or a fax machine to send documents instead of, instead of um, using a document sharing platform or e-signatures, you know, to, to chat? Uh, and the idea is what you're doing today works, but someone else could be doing it better and very quickly, you know, provide 
that sort of competitive risk uh, to you by, by doing it. So, so this is where you're saying, well, how can we do this a bit better? Um, and strategic risk is really understanding, okay, assuming everything is running great and everything's up to date, what is the five-year growth plan of the company? Where, where are we going to be? Are we going to be in exactly the same space? All right, then I guess things are fine. <laughs> um, but realistically speaking, here's you know, where we expect to be. Here's we're, we're growing from 100 attorneys to 500 attorneys. We're growing you know, from yeah, being just in North America to being in Europe and Asia, whatever it is. You've, you've got a plan. And the idea is you start looking at your processes today and say, okay, so we need to make these updates. These are the impacts that it's going to have. And more often than not, companies are doing this retroactively, right? The company expands and grows massively, and they say, well, we got to update all our processes to catch up. But you really should have updated them before you grew, you know, you know that much. Uh, so this is the thing that you want to look at. So again, bringing it back into automation, this is what you want to understand. Um, if you're going to grow from a 100% you know, uh, firm to a 500% firm, and you know that you're going to be incorporating some automation along the way, great. So now you can say, well, we're going to be hiring 200 people a year. Maybe we should look at some HR onboarding processes that we can automate and, and have well aligned and, and things like that, right? So it gives you a better focus, a, a better idea on where to focus um, these things. Uh, Lee, Jonathan, I don't know if there's anything you want to. Well, I, I just want to jump off that last point about um, getting things in order before you add on people. When, one of the things I see a lot of times in these situations is, you know, people know, know what their processes are and how to do things. And so they don't think this sort of documentation is necessary. And to a certain extent, they're right. But uh, I always like to propose to them the the lottery slash bus, um, what if, which depending on how well you like the person doing the job, what if they win the lottery so they quit or they get hit by a bus so they quit. Um, either way, suddenly this known process, you don't have that knowledge anymore. So I do think you're absolutely right. It, not only from an automation standpoint, just from a general business standpoint, this sort of stuff is better documented and documented in a clear understandable way so that if someone does come in day one with that process suddenly only held on paper they're able to just look at that paper look at that chart look 100%. at a textual form and they're able to pick it up and jump in and just like you're saying here if if you don't have that that's a that's a risk <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um i i agree 100 percent. i think i the the idea of undocumented processes keeps me up at night. <laughs> yeah, one thing I would add too is sometimes those a, a small inefficient process might not be problematic when you're at a certain size, mm -hmm. your organization is at a certain size. <laughs> so say one person is going through this inefficient process, but then you grow and all of a sudden it's five or 10 people doing yeah. that same inefficient process. And then you have all these people, you know, doing something differently, you know, yeah. so now, now you don't have any consistency, um, you know, people are following different methodologies. So it, it can truly compound exponentially your problems, your inefficiency yeah. when you grow on top of a small inefficiency, you know, you can see just, and, and, um, you know, you add, in the idea of new locations mm -hmm. and uh, new regulations. Working there's remotely. <laughs> some, yeah, working remotely. You know, there's all these factors that, um, so, you know, just because you've, you've put five people through an inefficient process where you only had one, it might be 10 times the problem um, because of all the other circumstances. So I think really having those understanding that understanding before you grow um, is is critical because you can you could find yourself you know a couple of years down the road with a much bigger problem than you ever expected. <laughs> and I know this is going a little bit off on this tangent that we're discussing, but that's the glory of webinars. We can go off on tangent. <laughs> but I, I'm actually working with a client right now on data minimization project, and they had this problem with their paralegals. They didn't have processes in place and defined. And so paralegals would save data wherever the paralegal was saving <laughs> yeah. it. And yeah. so now you've got network drives filled with data, duplicative or whatnot, but those paralegals are long gone. 
And so making sure that nothing in there actually is required is proving yeah. to be a time consuming headache for these attorneys that are picking through the stuff. And so it's just, you might not realize that the pro you might think these processes are a, not a problem now because it's one person or even because it's five or 10 people. Absolutely. But after 10 years of doing this process in our hosted data word world where you're paying by gigabyte, how yeah. much is that process yeah. going to compound to? Yeah. Um, so I think I think not only a numbers consideration from a personnel standpoint, but also from a time standpoint. Absolutely. We yeah, had, uh, I, mean, I was just going to say that's a great point. Uh, just from from a uh, employee turnover or you know adding or onboarding new employees, um, you know the, these little problems um, can can fester in the background, and and you can find you're faced with a huge problem. You know, like as you said, if if key employees leave and you don't have a process mapped out. Um, now, no one knows how to handle that process, or you're bringing on new people and new locations, you don't know how to train them or how, you know, how to guide them to follow through a certain process. Um, so, so these little things can really um, become big problems later on if you haven't identified them. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think that's, that's one of the, the biggest risks. And, you know, on that, on that, some of kind of that same topic, one of the considerations for automation, I think as well, that's worth looking at is the uh, different things to think about for each process. So, you know, part of that includes the complexity, it includes stuff like how well documented it is, because as you grow, all of that is going to, gonna, gonna um, you know, become a, a big issue. And that's exactly what we're trying to understand here. Uh, and there's no, you know, I, and I'm always cautious about saying stuff like this, because there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute right or wrong answer. Uh, I've seen companies that have done everything that wasn't, uh, well, that, that, that wasn't technically what I'd recommend, but turned out, you know, really well. But it's important to consider before you're doing something, how well, you know, is this process documented? How well do people understand the way it's documented? And, and yes, question is, are they following them? That goes back to process risk, but is it even documented? Because if it's not, what are you actually trying to automate here? What do you what do you actually know? And and I love the whole you know lottery bus uh, discussion because that 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna start using that more, um, but that's exactly what it is. Um, as well as you know looking at process complexity, Jonathan, you mentioned you know the case where somebody has this really complex process that you know might be used once or twice a year, but but it's this big massive behemoth that that's causing a lot of issues and people want to go after it. Why is that really the first thing? I, again, agree it needs to be tackled. But is that really, you know, sort of the first thing you want to go down? Um, yeah. And I, and I think another another one is is process lifecycle that people don't give enough consideration for because when you want to do something and it's a process that turns around in a week or two, whether it's something like invoice processing, it's gone, or or, or contract approvals, versus. Uh, purchasing new property that can take six months for commercial real estate, for example. Is mm -hmm. that really a process you want to tackle right away? Because this has a long life cycle that the same execution, you know, is in work. So any changes are impacting um, all sorts of governance headaches uh, when, mm -hmm. when things are already going through. And then obviously the importance of it is this, is this a process that you can afford to say, let's quickly deploy something. If there's a couple of bugs, no big deal. Or, or is this something where, okay, the system crashed and now we're you know, com at a complete standstill. We don't want that either. So, so yeah. and then integrations into upstream downstream, these are just things that I think people should think about uh, before going down that, that automation journey. And I would say one other thing to consider, which you sort of touched on, but if this automation process doesn't, project doesn't go well, mm. there's not gonna be appetite for another one in the future. Ah, yes. You're, you've got to worry about the internal public relations of these types of projects, because if this is your first one, this is going to dictate its success or failure will dictate <laughs> what people think about yeah. it going forward. Yeah, for so. sure. For no, sure. that's really, really important. And, pro and just adoption of that, uh, you know, that process or that automation. Um, if, if people are turned off by it, or there isn't a good result, then it just makes it that much more difficult to engage them later on or, or try to bring on another project. So that's, yeah. 
you know, once again, if you can find those those smaller projects that give you a lot of bang for the buck, um, give you a good win, have a lot of buy-in, um, have a lot of people touching it so that that they're using it daily, you know, um, yeah. so that there's that that sense of engagement. All those things increase the success. Um, but as you say, if it's something that you only touch a couple times a year, you know, who remembers how to go through it? Or, yeah. you know, it, it just doesn't make a, an impact um, like something you touch every single day or multiple times a day, something like that. Mm -hmm. I would also I would also put forward that there's a similar situation when we're talking about the technology that we use, um, where I've seen scenarios and, and, you know, from a vendor perspective, Jonathan, you might have seen that as well, where people say, oh, we're we tried to go down the process automation road and it was a big mess. We're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of interrogate and push them, why? Sometimes it's, as you said, it's because the, it wasn't done properly. It was in the right process. It was a bad example. Sometimes it's because they took the right techno wrong technology. Yep. Um, I've, I've had users, you know, pick an RPA tool to, to implement business process management and sure. gotten really, really frustrated with it and sort of like throwing their hands up in the air and say, oh, it's all hype. It doesn't work. And we've had to sit and educate them on that. And I think that's sort of some, one of those challenges as well. Again, talking process and, and technology. Um, and, and on that note, and I'd love to sort of like discuss this as well with both of you, um, but kind of quickly for our audience to put everybody into you know the, the same frame of mind of what kind of technology is out there when we talk process automation. Uh, this is not by any means a hard and fast rule. Um, someone can argue with me on every single square here and that's fine. Uh, it's just sort of indicative of the different types of things out there. Um, the first one that I talk about is robotic process automation. It's is misleading in my professional opinion because it's got the word process in there. Uh, realistically, it should be called robotic task automation, which is what it, it, it is mostly. We're talking about repeatable user tasks. You can scale them very quickly. You, you build these little bots. There's you know, many different ways to do it. Uh, it's very quick to deploy, but typically doesn't link to your business process or doesn't necessarily link to your overall end-to-end -end process. Uh, it's a very, very powerful tool when used uh, correctly, when used in line with business process governance. Uh, the other thing is workflow automation. That's you know taking a few more process steps and saying, how do we automate it? Uh, sometimes it can be the end-to-end -end process. Sometimes it isn't. Uh, sometimes it's very limited to a certain system. So for example, your ERP system will have some workflow capability within the ERP system that might talk to one or two systems, but mostly not. Um, and, and so it tends to reside sort of within that. And most of these workflows are still independent of the documented process. So you build a workflow in theory that lines up with your documentation. But every time you update your documentation, you, someone has to remember to go and update these workflows as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, digital process automation is very gray and very difficult to define, but it is a word that's being used much more. It's also called business process automation. Um, and essentially, it's sort of workflow automation, but taken out of the system, if you will. So take it out of the ERP. And it's more standalone automation platforms uh, that you know, connect across multiple systems that use you know, all sorts of connectors. Um, and, and they're meant to really take that end-to-end -end process automation piece. But they're still, again, usually not linked to the documented process. So it's still something that's technology only. Um, and, you know, whatever paper processes, and I use paper as a very liberal term there, whatever paper processes you have, you know, if they get updated, you need to update whatever automation uh, workflows you've built in your DPA tool. And both workflow and digital process automation uh, take user tasks through forms and, and, and so on. Um, and one of the big differences as well with RPA is RPA's tools are designed to interface with other systems using the same user interface that a, that a user has. So you can program an RPA tool to open your, your browser and navigate to a certain web page and type something in the search bar and pull up results. Uh, whereas with workflows and DPA, you're typically integrating to the back end uh, behind these systems. And the last thing is business process management, which is a discipline and not a tool. However, today, most business process management tools include big elements of workflow automation within them as well. 
Um, but BPM is really looking at process documentation, process management, governance, um, their standardized notation using BPM and 2.0, which again, a lot of workflow tools and digital process tools are, are also taking in uh, right now. And um, this is really looking at your process. So typically with BPM, you've got your processes documented and then you can build some automation pieces into it, but it's not a dedicated automation tool only. Uh, if you will. So these are the four mm, classifications I like to, I like to, you know, when I look at a new tool, I look at a new vendor, I always try to put them in a certain square because it helps me picture where they are. And, you know, for our audience, you know, to Lee's point, when you're talking to vendors, when you're exploring technology out there and exploring what you're trying to do, it's also important to understand, you know, each element of this quadrant has its benefits. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have tools in each one of them, uh, but obviously you want to see how you can you know, manage that well and so on. And, and it's just something to, to be very, very aware of. Jonathan, I'm sure you have something you want to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it goes back to the point we were talking about earlier. It's, it's important um, early on in the, the process with the client to get a good understanding of, of what their, their needs are and how, how closely, um, as a vendor, your solution matches what, what they're after, um, so that you're going down the same road together, so that you're not, um, they're not thinking they, they want to do one particular, or go down one particular road, and you cannot match that, that functionality. You can't support them in that direction. So it is, you know, I think very important for, for the future relationship uh, between the vendor and client to to understand that know where those those uh, the needs align with the solution and make sure that they're well matched so that you're that that you're not going down the wrong road together and and you know spending potentially weeks and and months thinking you're going to do one thing and and find out you know your your expectations are entirely different. Yeah. I I know we're running short on time and we have a couple more slides left, so I don't want to go too far afield, but I am curious, um, Jonathan, since Shyamal um, said he tries to fit everybody into one of this, these boxes, <laughs> um, but he did caveat that at the beginning that it wasn't hard and fast. So I am curious where you would say Neota falls in on these boxes, if anywhere, if, if only one or if <laughs> Yeah, I think we're going to fall, you know, primarily in the, the workflow automation, but as Shai Mal was saying, there's overlap in all these areas. So, so we, we definitely align with the BPM, um, you know, uh, uh, standards, um, you know, there is the digital process automation aspect. I would say the RPA is probably the least um, aligned with, with our products. Those are um, uh, sort of a different set of solutions, yeah. I think, and and fit probably a, a very specific um, use case for a lot of organizations. Uh, whereas the workflow, uh, you know, is is very flexible, and we'll talk a bit, bit about you know um, point solutions versus platform solutions. So, do you need a very specific? A solution to a problem or do you want a broader set of tools that can address not only one use case but potentially uh, a set uh, solve a whole set of, of particular problems that you're facing okay so just like that Shaima, your quadrants have been breached and <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, as, as technology evolves, I, th I expect more and more that this is either going to completely dissolve into one, one big square or it's going to break into about a hundred different types of things out there. We'll see where technology takes us. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's definitely blurring of lines, um, uh, particularly as different products adopt um, aspects of other uh, products, you know, so, so everyone uh, maybe starts out with with going after one particular niche, mm -hmm. and then and then they often find, hey, we really need to expand <laughs> our yeah. functionality so that that our our clients can take use of, make use of of a broader yeah. set of solutions. 
Absolutely. I just want to quickly uh, remind all the participants that if you have questions, you know, feel free to type them to the box. Um, we'll try and answer, you know, as many as we can, uh, depending on the time that we have left. But feel free to type questions into into the question and answer box on your on your Zoom controls. So um, I'll, I'll take this and then you, we can certainly discuss it. We talked a bit about you know, platform solutions versus point solutions. And uh, point solutions are kind of the legacy um, uh, solutions that a lot of us see in the market. They're, you know, solutions that are designed for uh, solving a particular problem. Um, they're usually quick to, to set up, uh, relatively low cost, um, but there are some trade-offs with a with point solution. Um, you know, quite often, they're a one size fits all, so, so you can't really customize them. We know almost every organization, although they have similarities, also have differences, also have very specific needs. And these point solutions can be difficult sometimes to accommodate those, those, um, those differences between systems. Also, their, their ability to integrate with other uh, technology within your organization. So quite often they come with a preset um, uh, set of integrations, uh, but if you have other systems that aren't included to try to build a custom integration between a point solution and um, some, some other custom system can often be difficult. And you can find that you know, in the long term, the cost for maintaining that point solution um, uh, really can grow over several years. So, so it can limit what you thought was going to be a low cost solution could turn out to be, you know, a, a more expensive solution over the, um, you know, over the long run. And that's particularly true if you find, hey, we have new use cases or we have new automation problems that we need to solve that our point solution cannot address so we have to bring on other products so often you're supporting a whole suite of different products um, you know which increases your cost your complexity mm -hmm. uh, and all of that so um, you know the original uh, intention of saving costs and, and doing something quickly can often become you know a more uh, more tedious task in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this this kind of also goes back to the whole um, um, strategic risk of scaling, where you might have a certain tool that works for an organization of let's say fifty people, uh, and if you plan on scaling to five hundred, that's not going to work. But you can't mm -hmm. simply scale. You you literally have to then find another point solution for that size and migrate everything over. It's not something yeah. that you can just just sort of like uh, uh, grow and scale into it. Definitely. The, the only two things I would add into this are just um, the terminology that I frequently hear used for things like this are um, off the shelf because yeah. you sort of get this prepackaged thing and that's basically what you have. You know, limited yeah. customization yeah. options, like you said, but. Um, off the shelf is what I usually use with clients and what I hear other people using um, in other contexts. And also yeah. uh, from the standpoint of things changing, you know, you might have a point solution that relies on Windows 7 and suddenly Windows 7 <laughs> <Yeah>. is no more. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Dependencies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Just something to keep in mind with those types of things. So. I Definitely. think there's a, uh, and I think you might touch this on, on the next slide as well, but I, but I think there's also this thing where customization still has this negative connotation. Oh, it's going to cost me oh, yeah. so much because you're building me something custom. And I think, you know, the important thing to understand is that, that the point of a platform solution is that it's not customizing in the typical sense of recoding a solution for you. It's that you have a platform where you can build what you want. It's, it, it is, in a sense, customizing something, but not in a bad way, in a way that it's, it's meant to do. It's like building Legos. It's, it, it is yeah. customizing this Lego model, uh, but it's not really a custom car that you're building. Yeah, and customizing um, has gotten a negative connotation in technology over the years. And really, yeah. I, I actually like the term tailoring better oh, yeah. because yeah. you're really, you're taking a solution and you're tailoring it for the needs of the organization. We're not, we're not 
you know, lifting the hood and pulling out all the the cables and and retooling something. We're really taking a you know a, a no code often a tool set and uh, tailoring it around the needs of the organization. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just a couple other quick things. Um, you know, platform solutions can pay off in the long run in a lot of ways. I mean, they can end up saving costs, particularly if you have, you know, multiple use cases. Uh, also, there's this sense that your users have the same experience, you know, so you're not having them hop around to several different solutions with a slightly different uh, user experience. We all know um, that you know, even a simple solution, if it takes different steps or has a different look and feel, um, that can be somewhat jarring to the user experience. So having that consistent user experience is important. You know, having a single vendor um, uh, to, to use for all of your solutions is, is quite, you know, a lot easier in a lot of ways. I mean, you have uh, limited, you don't have to contract with separate vendors. You don't have to train on different platforms. And when you need support, you're going to one vendor as opposed to a whole suite of, of different vendors. Yeah, definitely. And I'm gonna jump on this slide because one of the questions we received was about how can you um, calculate potential savings using process automation before investing in the technology or a pilot project. And I would say that this is a good slide to talk about that. Um, yeah. But I, I think really that that's part of the planning process we were talking about at the beginning. You really have to investigate what, what your systems are and what your processes are and how much time you spend on each one and what billing level is being spent on. You know, if a admin assistant is doing something for an hour or to five hours mm -hmm. okay that's inefficient but if a named partner is spending 30 minutes on it that might be even more inefficient so um you really just have to it's about calculating out the cost the present cost then looking at the improvements you think you can make or for automation the automated portion you think you can get handled and how that will impact the time cost. Absolutely. Um, so I, it really is just sort of a math and estimating and math equation at that point. Yeah. Um, and definitely. I think that's that's the best thing about about the service industry, like the legal industry, because it's that it is really that easy. How many hours of non-billable admin overhead can you save? You know, and, and it's very easy to, to come up with a number compared to, mm -hmm. for example, many other industries that you've got a lot of things to look at. Um, I agree. I, I think that's the best way to look at potential savings. It does take yeah, time, probably. you know, to, yep. to dig into it. You want to make oh, yeah. sure you, you do it properly, uh, but it is relatively easy that way. Excellent. So I know we're running short on time and, and we will pr give you all these slides and, and the presentation, but I just wanted to sort of wrap up uh, before we address a couple questions with um, some of the most significant benefits of platform solutions. So. Um, you know, the, the platform solution can give you, you know, many custom solutions as opposed to having, you know, single point solutions. But I think an important point there is that you can also continue to update and maintain those. So often these solutions are tied to, you know, uh, changing requirements, changing regulations, things of that nature. If you have a, a solution that you can easily update, then you can keep those tools fresh so that they're not uh, you're not going back to the vendor to get updates or or deal with those kind of changes. They can also scale quite easily. So, you know, if you find a solution that works effectively for one department, you may want to scale it out to, to multiple departments. A platform solution can allow you to expand that scope uh, quickly. And one of the key areas is integrating with all your other technology. Yeah. 
platform solutions are a lot more flexible as far as integrating with all your other technology uh, solutions. So if you want something that, that's flexible enough to, to integrate with everything you have now, but not only that, things that you might have in the future, or as Lee was saying, if uh, you know we get a new version of Windows or a new version of, of some other tool that you're using, how quickly can you bring your platform up to speed um, with with a, a platform solution, uh, you can update those integrations uh, quite easily. And I, I would also add here that I know we mentioned the point solutions tend to be legacy at this point. At mm -hmm. Point solutions tend to be legacy these days. Um, yeah. But it, it's those legacy products also that tend to eventually be abandoned or mm -hmm. from development or to not get updated so or or to get bought out by some other platform and incorporated and no longer available as a point solution so sure. I, I i find that just generally speaking it the platforms really are from a longevity standpoint if you're looking at implementing something now you're probably and you're implementing it for the long term you probably do want to be looking at these platform solutions first and yeah a point solution if you really do have, you have worked on your processes and you've identified a specific need that something off the shelf really does target. Yeah. Then yeah. it would be a good fit. But um, yeah. generally speaking, I, I'm definitely seeing more and more the platform eating the market share. That a hundred percent. I think that's that's the way. That's the that's the way of the future. Uh, I know we are we are way over time. Um, you know, two minutes. And, two minutes. That's not <laughs> two minutes. Well, we haven't really gotten into <laughs> details of questions. Uh, but maybe what I want to do real quick is also let everybody who's still you know on the call know that the slides will be shared, and and uh, I believe that and the recording will be available as well. Uh, but on the slides, you also have uh, all three of our email addresses, so you can anyone you know feel free to reach out with you know any questions that we haven't gotten a chance to answer or anything you want to dig into a little more. Uh, but I do feel like there's one more question that, that Jonathan, you should sort of take, which is, you know, someone's asking, uh, can you please tell me a little bit more about Neota? I work for a corporate legal department and looking for a workflow tool, but not sure where to start to evaluate providers. Definitely. Well, um, Neota is, you know, a pretty uh, broad platform solution. You know, we, we address uh, document automation, expertise automation, and workflow automation. And probably the best idea is for us to sit down and, and walk through that individually and see how well that matches up uh, with what you're, you're looking at now. Um, we do have a lot of good resources. Um, on our website as well that that sort of highlight uh, some of the key functionality. Um, but as I said um, before, our, our job as a vendor is really to engage you, get a good understanding of what your needs are and see how well our solution uh, matches up with those. Uh, and that's something we're happy to do at any time. Perfect. Um, in that case, if, uh, if, you know, everyone has your email address, they, I guess they can reach out to you directly, uh, Jonathan, or, or through the website, I'm guessing yep. on the, on the contact us form and, and learn more about, uh, Neora. Um, Definitely. I think, you know, from, from our side as panelists, I think that's everything from us, Hassan, I don't know if you want to jump back in and, and, uh, if you have anything. Hey, that was fantastic. Oh, so oh very, sorry. Very I, I think I cut Leo out there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I'm willing to give a couple more minutes if there are any other questions. And oh, I, did see, I did see in the chat that um, Claire had responded back a ways back, actually. Sorry, Claire, for taking so long. But um, people are less afraid of failure now. Assess why it failed and learn from those mistakes. Own it. That seems to be the way forward. And I agree with that mentality. Um, but I don't think everyone's there. I think it definitely yeah. depends on the firm or corporation and their leadership and, and their individual users to a certain extent. Um, I think that's the way of the future. I think more and more people are getting to that point with, especially with technology and with process improvement, because I think experience is showing you need to experiment, you need to try to improve. And if you fail, fine, you keep trying to improve a different way then. Um, yeah. So I definitely agree with, the sentiment, but I think from, from a 
right now standpoint, not everyone's there. Not everyone is willing to take that risk. And I think it just depends on uh, the leadership, the firm, the finances, the, the issues they're having. And I, so I think it's an individual thing. Um, but I definitely think, broadly speaking, I agree. And, and I think that leads to, to sort of another you know, point when we talk about sort of legacy systems versus the kind of platform solutions we have today, which is, I think, you know, th there is a certain gap between a lot of the executive team and leadership and people who've had, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of experience in the field and a lot of the, the younger, uh, more, more junior business analysts coming in. Uh, where the, And the, I think the reason for that is uh, 20 years ago, you really couldn't fail quickly and move on. You know, technology was massive investments. Uh, implementing an ERP system was a huge time and money investment that companies were mm -hmm. making. Failure wasn't something you could say, let's fail and move on. Um, that's, that's sort of that world. And I think a lot of that still resonates today with, with a lot of executive team members who, who kind of don't see that failure as an option versus truth be told, a lot of tools today are, uh, let's deploy it in a matter of weeks. Let's, let's get pulled out, let's get a pilot. Well, it didn't work. We've learned something. Let's move on. Let's fix it. Let's do do something else. And that's the very agile, you know, software development methodology that that a lot of people have in their minds today. And that's a sort of disconnect that I see. And and sometimes it's just training people that it's okay. We let's yeah. assume this fails. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to make it okay. But if it doesn't, here's how it'll be better. And really having that that sort of picture because we're not no, talking about five million dollar investments into ERP systems and things like that. You know. I think that's a good point. I mean, a lot of uh, there's a lot of long term memory around failed uh, technology projects or complicated or painful projects, um, you know, and you have to sort of set that aside. The other thing to consider is, you know, as you're onboarding more younger staff and attorneys, the expectation is that there will be Absolutely. technology there to support them. Um, so you really have to. Um, if we've learned anything over the last year and a half is that you need to be able to change quickly. Um, and if anything, we've accelerated that over the past year and a half. Yeah. And, you know, we need to have those tools available to help um, uh, deal with, with a rapidly changing world and uh, a world that expects a certain level of technology and automation to, you know, to accommodate what they're after. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. No, nobody else took advantage of that delay to ask more <laughs> questions. So, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think time to wrap it up there. But um, no, that was some fantastic insights and very, very interesting to see. Um, quite an open discussion from you know the consultancy and vendor size, just as kind of go on the other side of that dichotomy and that relationship just to see where um, the other side is coming from when you're approaching these uh, things. So yeah, thank you very, very much, everyone. Um, and yeah, so as previously stated, um, the recording will be available with a slide deck, of course. Um, we will ping an email around for that. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks Excellent. very much for having thank us. You. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>